Hi, Peter. Welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. I have Peter Panagore, who has a fascinating story and journey that's just so inspiring and interesting to me. So, Peter, if you want to just share a little bit um, about yourself, where you are, when this experience started for you, and we'll just we'll start there. I'll start with where I am because today I'm outside and I live uh, in a house that's surrounded by the ocean on a peninsula. Uh, the water is a little distance from us, but it's chilly, but it's beautiful in October, so I'm outside. But I am a near-death experiencer, and I died the first time ice climbing in Western Canada and the Rocky Mountains in 1980 from exposure. It completely changed my life. Before that, I was raised outside of Boston, Massachusetts. I went to Catholic high school. I was raised also Greek Orthodox and Roman Catholics, mixed family. The two churches didn't like each other historically, is putting it politely. And so I was raised with a, an understanding that both claimed to be true and only, but neither could be if the other made the same claim. So my religious upbringing was always filled with question, and it was also filled with mysticism. I w began having mystical experiences as a child. I haven't talked a lot about that in the years that I've been doing interviews because for the most part of my coming open out of the closet with my NDE, my first one is that it was safer to come out as a near-death experiencer than it was to come out as a person who began having mystical experiences as a child if I wanted to keep my, my very tenuous credibility <laughs> among my professional peers. <laughs> Yes. So, Peter, I actually have Peter's book here. It is called Heaven is Beautiful. If you haven't read it, go read it. But there is um, something you reference in here about how our secrets can keep us sick. So in this kind of period of time where you really weren't sharing your story or just a very small portion of your story. And can you speak to your personal experience with how maybe that impacted you just holding the secret for so long. Oh yeah, I uh, held it for 20 years. Mm -hmm. My wife knew, uh, I, the, the problem with this secret is, how do I, where do I, I'll say, I'll say, I'll begin the, in, in this place, that uh, I have spent much of my, a lot of my life are, uh, around the gay community. And in the gay community, there was a lot of closeting and there and and that had an impact on all relationships. We all know about this and how the modern uh, people in the you know, broader LBGTQI community um, uh, don't have necessarily that same sort of confinement that similar. That's a similar sort of confinement in which I found myself only I had no peer group. And so my secret I kept it so close and so tight um, because of the threat of a real threat of being institutionalized as a result of sounding like an insane person. Yeah. So what that did to me, because it's all about relationship mm -hmm. um, in, hum in human society. And so I, I, I lied, to, I became a congregational minister I, but for me, God was non-gendered and no thing. And I was in a state of union and light. So in love, unlimited for everybody. Mm -hmm. But I was hiding out in the church because it was a convenient place for me to uh, continue my mystical exploration and my yoga practices and my meditation and my studies. And no one would be the wiser. So I uh, lied to my congregation every Sunday over all the time that I was a minister by leading them a lie of omission, uh, according to the Catholic church, uh, mm -hmm. I didn't tell them the truth that I was not a believer. And, and that I, so every time I spoke the language, I was fibbing a little bit more. And I knew that I was doing this, but I felt that I was, if I told, if I revealed what I began to know, because this was a long process of just self-understanding, and it's still ongoing. Um, but because there was no one else in the world that I knew like me, 
Um, I found my peer group in the long dead mystics of all religions, the oneness teachers. And I dove into them as my friends. And but the lie that I told in the world kept me safe, but it also on my interior, I think I created a darkness for myself. I think I, I, when I got encased back in my body again, even though everything radiated light in the world, I, I was given a mission to speak, but no language to say it. And so I locked that. I had two layers of locking. I had this first layer of locking was, well, you didn't give me any words to talk about this thing. How am I supposed to talk about it? I can't talk about it till I have something to say about it. But then there's this other layer that was over that was to, uh, isolate myself from people. And, but here's the thing, as much as I hit it, Lizzie, everybody knew I was weird. Um, <laughs> It was no hiding my behavior. I could keep my mouth shut, but my my ministerial behavior in particular was perfectly public in my communities, and my way of living as a person was on broad display. And so uh, one of the great things about where I live now, and this is the same place I lived in when I was this minister, um, was that Eventually, when I came out here, everybody, having seen my behaviors, were like, oh, that's why. <laughs> um, so. Yeah. Well, let, let's help our audience understand a little bit more. I know many, many people are familiar with your story, but I think a lot of people still aren't depending on the audience. So if you could take us back a little bit to that day of the ice climbing um, and just give everyone a little bit about your story and what happened um, while you were climbing and when you transitioned, um, that would be great. It's a long story, but I'll tell it briefly. I was uh, ice climbing in Western Canada. I, I have to give a little bit of background because this was, although it was my first ice climb, it was not my first wilderness experience. I'd had plenty of that starting as a young kid in all seasons and, and doing all several different kinds of sports um, out in the, including backpacking um, out in the wilderness in the cold. So I was an exchange student at Montana State University. I didn't want to go home for spring break. I wanted to have an adventure. I found a fella in the outdoor club who had planned a 10 day snow caving backcountry ski trip topped off by a one day ice climb. Mm -hmm. Backcountry winter camping was up my alley, it's things I'd done. So I agreed and I'd done ropes and rock climbing and faces. I'd been tra training in ropes and rock for a while, but ice was new to me and I couldn't come up with all the gear that I needed. I was short an ax. I had a, an ax and a hammer and the hammer is a climb, a tool that you can use to climb with, but it's, I can take it from me. It's <laughs> not advisable. Um, I, I, We'll, we'll, we'll all wash over why I was in that position, but that's the equipment that I had. And so I convinced my partner, my climbing partner, Tim, that I could do this climb. He had just completed his uh, advanced, not advanced, but uh, certification for lead ice climber. So advanced ice climbing, um, but first level certification. Knew what he was doing. I talked him into it. We made this ascent. It took us twice as long as everyone else on the face that day, other teams. And the reason it took so long is because I couldn't swing my hammer up as high as my ax. Ax is longer. Every, every, it's like taking mincing steps instead of pacing long steps. And also, it, I couldn't relax with the hammer. I had to grip it the whole time, which meant I burned out my muscles. So by the time we were a couple of hours from the top, five or 600 feet up, the temperature where well, the sun was going down and all the other teams had descended and we knew we were in a grave situation. I was also on the National Ski Patrol at this point. And so I'd been 
um, since I was in high school. And so I uh, was up on hypothermia and how it can kill you and frostbite as well. And by the time we reached the ledge of the top of our climb, temperature dropped as the sun set about, and then it was 30 degrees down. Hypothermia began immediately. It was going to kill us. And we knew that. And so we discussed stay, staying where we were because that's what you do in the wilderness so they can find you. But if we stayed where we were, we, we were going to die. There was no doubt. And hypothermia for us began with this rapid uh, firing of all of our muscles independently of each other in this shiver like I can't describe. Clattering jaw, like tongue. The whole thing was involved. Everything's like, everything's moving. And and then through the whole night, we traversed in the dark under starlight for most of the night, roped to each other, you know, with those huge drop off to the side, uh, sometimes on ice, sometimes on rock, with crampons, uh, no more food, advancing hypothermia, water from snow and ice. And as the hypothermia advances, it it takes your took our reason, it took our 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 um decision good decision making skills became less and less frostbite came in i am out, so I'm, out, I'm outside today because i love the outdoors but i'm wearing half gloves and a coat because even though it's sunny and warm over there it's chilly over here in the shade and i my thermometer got all wrecked and so my my inner thermometer is uh it it, it this this cold froze my eyeballs it it made it it made my jaw it made it difficult to move my jaw to speak it made us have to be exacting with every movement that we had because we had to conserve our energy because moving forward was what was keeping us warm but as we moved forward we consumed the energy that we couldn't replace and we were skinny minis and uh so there was nothing to draw from but muscle and the pressure of the of the time that we knew it was going to take us to get down against our energy loss and our need to stay warm pushed us every step closer to death so the the, the closer we get to the bottom the more likely we are to die sooner because we weren't going to be able to keep ourselves warm so there was all this going on and we had both of us one of the things i learned i'm, I'm rattling on here lizzie you want me to keep going you or I mean, share whatever you feel most comfortable. Okay, I'll get to the death part soon. Uh, <laughs> it, it, the, the, I reached this place inside myself where my animal brain took over my survival and my body functioned without the necessity of my decision to drive myself forward. I was suddenly being driven forward by this other part of me that I didn't know existed. That still, I, I know that it's there like today. I know it's there. So we made it to the last rappel as all this was going on and we're clipped into the mountain and the rope got stuck up around a corner and we couldn't pull it down. It was jammed and hypothermia by this point had super advanced. It was lit. It was late in the night getting toward dawn, getting colder as the night went. Uh, my body heated up. I unzipped my coat even though I knew better in my brain because I knew better, uh, but I was hot. Part of, part of hypothermia, one part of it is that your body feels like it's getting super hot, even though it actually, you're freezing. Yeah, it's, it might be when my, to my, my internal temperature thing got all messed up. Um, and yeah, so my brain knew better, but I didn't care. And I, as I unzipped my coat, of course, I got colder. Um, I, and I, I then had this peace come over me when I recognized that we weren't going to get out of this. We were stuck on this cliff. We were, we were harnessed into the mountain for the first time. Um, one rappel to go. This, is, this was the training rappel spot. So there was harness, there were, we were strapped right in there. We weren't going to fall. Um, but we couldn't go down and we couldn't go up and we couldn't get the rope. And that was that. So I started thinking about my parents and God and peace and settled over me. And then I died. Uh, my body shut off. 
I had this tunnel vision that came. I had fallen asleep a couple of times, but this tunnel vision came. And as this tunnel vision came, uh, this peace expanded. This peace expanded and eliminated all of my pain. But I, I didn't understand what was going on because I thought I was falling asleep as this tunnel closed in front of me, this tunnel vision. But I didn't lose consciousness. Every time I had fallen asleep, I lost consciousness. I did not lose consciousness. And as this, as this closed, I woke up, which was contradictory to what I expected. And all of my pain was gone. And I was confused. I didn't really know what was happening. But in front of me where the mountain was supposed to be, but I knew I must have fallen. I must have fallen, but I felt like I was standing. But this, where the mountain was, this huge dark expanse appeared. And I was not in the expanse. I was to the, just to the edge of, on the edge of the expanse. And this expanse was not confusing. The expanse wasn't confusing. I was confused about what was going on. But the expanse was just a darkness that had no threat. And, 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 and far in the distance, as I was trying to figure out what was going on, a, a pinprick of light appeared. And this pinprick was distance. It was the distance of the furthest galaxy that, the, the, that we can see with humanity's technology now. And it rushed toward me faster than the speed of light. It, and as it came toward me, it filled my vision my space of what I could see, and it communicated to me directly in a packet of information, not in language. It told me it was taking me, and I said, no, you're not. I don't know what's going on, but I'm staying here, and it reached inside of me and took me, and when it took me, it reached around me. I seem to have, I've never described myself, what I saw of myself in as I stood on the edge, I had a shape of a human being, but I was still more material than spiritual. I wasn't a physical body, but I had my thinking brain was still connected to me somehow. And, and, when, and then I was grasped and taken. As soon as I was taken, all of that was gone. I, I'd been out of my body before. Uh, this, there was a severing of, of connection that was apparent to me, that this was a different kind of experience. And then I was en engulfed in this, this entity that was made of light and superpositioned because it was both the fullness of, this, of infinity and a limitation of it. And I was inside this limitation. So it, when it was speaking to me, it had the, like the echo of the divine in a, cl in a closeness, but it was much bigger than what I was perceiving. And so my, my story is long, but the most important part, um, I go into heaven, I have all these other kind of things happen to me, but the most important part is that all of humanity is beloved. And we have been beloved since we are created, in, innate to our very being and the construction of, of who we are, not because we're human, but because everything is made this way. There is nothing that exists that is outside this light. It's like a woven web through all the material world. And, and although the, I'm sitting in the sunshine out here and it looks like light, this is also darkness to me. This is a darkness to me because it is a density and a, 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 a thickness and a slowness that I've seen since the day I came back. And it is like a two-dimensional black and white film, but there's light inside of everything. And this light is hidden from human eyes, but experiential with the eye of the soul. And, and many people experience this sort of divine energy in nature. That's why, that's why I live in nature, because it speaks to me here, talks to my heart. I know that it's there. But what I saw when I was dead is that we are all utterly beloved and that, that although I went through a hell of my own making where I experienced all of the suffering I had caused in my life from the point of view of the person who experienced it simultaneous you, with, pardon? Are you referencing the life review at this point? I think most I am. fairly 
interested in that piece. Um, but I think some people haven't even heard the term life review. So um, yeah, if you could just explain a little bit, because I, you know, I know there's beauty to it. And then I know you have a, a chapter in here about like your own hell. Um, and so if you can just kind of explain both sides, I think that would be really helpful for people. Well, I, I touched on the first side of light just a moment ago. The, one of the things that happened once I was entered into this great void, this bigger mm -hmm. void beyond, beyond the carrying in, carrying by this conscious angel in which I could see myself from the outside. I had this all sorts of, uh, I was superpositioned while this was going on. Um, but inside this, this dark void of the belly of the, the heavens, um, I went, I was in timelessness. And so I tell my story, I often tell my story in a sequence, but that's really not the way I experienced it. And so the, it's appropriate for me for the first time to tell the story with love at the beginning, because love was present all the way through this, even through my purgative, what I now call my purgative fire of divine love. Uh, even as I went through this hell of my own making, the, the, the love that I experienced later in my NDE was present on first entry. Uh, there was never not there. It was always this overwhelming tidal wave of beauty. And, and I went, so I went in my life review in this life was to experience all of the pain that I'd given away in my life, especially by intent from two points of view. I experienced them from my point of view all my reasons and emotions from early, early, early on uh, for wanting to cause pain and then in specific circumstances. And then I was the person I was causing that pain to in that specific circumstance simultaneously. I was inside this other person experiencing all of the chronology of all of the pain that I'd caused one person after the other person, one event after the other event from the inside of the other person feeling they're a wash of chemical emotions, like their pain, their jealousy, their anger, their flash of rage, whatever it was, felt it all, felt my experience of wanting to give them this thing because I was angry at them or whatever I was feeling. Um, and so I, was, I experienced both things at once. And it turned out that the pain that I gave them as they experienced it was 10,000 times greater than what I had any idea that I was doing to them. And that all of that pain that I had given to them was actually mine. It had come back to me in my karma. My sins accrued to me. They were mine. I caused them. And, and as I experienced this, I judged myself, not because I was guilty, but because in the purity of the love was so overwhelming that I could see my own errors. Errors. That, that I had done these things. And that because I was limited in form, because simultaneous to this, I could see all of humanities being exactly like me. And that although I had these free will choices to cause this pain, the design of the whole place kind of puts me in a bad position along with everybody else. I'm kind of pressed up against the wall here, but everybody's with me. Doesn't matter who they are or what they do, because our limited nature in comparison to the unlimited is incomparable. So I have a question about, and maybe it's more than one question, but with anger and intention and kind of how that um, process works in our life review. I mean, anger is we can be, we can use it to cause harm and we can also use it to fight for justice and protect people. Yeah, in sure. Um, maybe the elderly or young children. And so when we are fighting, so to say, to protect people and our intention is to be helpful, do we then still experience the pain that they feel for their consequences? Or are we feeling kind of the goodness of our intended purpose to protect? 
you have, I don't even know if you have an answer. I know exactly what you're talking about because I spent a large part of my career working in domestic violence. And at the end of my career, after I was, when I worked with domestic violence, when I was a minister deep into, deep into it, um, in a community level and a personal way, um, the then I sat on the domestic violence homicide review panel for the state of Maine with the attorney general's office and, re- and reviewed murders. Um, and the and so I've been in that position of battling for people um, and on behalf of those who can't battle for themselves, sort of right, righteous anger or justifiable anger, um, one might say. Before my first NDE, I didn't have any of that. Mm-hmm. I might have stood up for the kid who was getting bullied, but I don't remember. I don't remember that kind of popping up in my NDE. Uh, I don't remember popping up in my NDE the kids I hit back who were bullying me. I don't remember that. Um, mm-hmm. I expect in this, in my final death here, if I go through a flaming sort of purgative love to find love and beauty on the other side that if i have accrued the pain that i gave to those people as i worked on behalf of the defenseless um, so be it um it doesn't feel that way to me what it feels like to me is love and that when when i when i had and i was i worked in the anti-nuclear uh anti-freeze movement back in the 80s uh, I have an arrest record I was an anti-nuclear activist I started out as an angry anti-nuclear activist but after I died all of my anger went away I didn't I, I still don't carry the like I'll get angry and I'll because I'll get hurt you know I'm a human but it's easier to see the perpetrator as a human being even if that person does violence, because I also still see the light inside of them. And so in my responses to bullies of all different types and all different ways, um, I can't but help to see the light there, even as I fought against them. So I didn't have to hate them. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to, I didn't have to confuse my anger with my own projections. And, and instead, what I found is that by finding access to the source of all being inside myself, the more I cultivated that inside me, the easier it was to see it even in the person who's, who I'm glad is in prison for life. Yeah, okay. Which now this leads me to another question. My background's in psychology. So um, I do have a lot of people ask about narcissism or even people who have brain disorders or dementia or Alzheimer's and are acting in a way that they don't understand that they're acting. So somebody Mm -hmm. is angry or aggressive and hurting terribly lots of people how does that work for them well i have ideas about that but that's not my experience so i can only really speak from what i know but on this side of the veil what i know is that the biochemistry and upbringing create human beings and i've known people i knew a man once who before he had a virus invade his brain and totally take him over. And now he's still, this is 35 or 40 years later, he's still in quite a bit of care. Um, It's not his fault any more than cancer is someone's fault. But that doesn't mean that you need to take it from the narcissist. Whatever happens to them on the other side is is their deal, not yours. And so people ask me about that. They ask me about Paul Pot and the Camar Rouge and Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin, and they pick the worst of the worst of humanity. And and the, the question's still the same. Do they get theirs? All I know is that in my experience, uh, I was 
able to accept the light despite the pain that I had caused because I turned to the light because the light's power was so overwhelming to me that I could not resist it. Now, is that true for everyone? I don't know. But what I do know is that the core of, the, of these people who, who have done egregious harm to others, sometimes in genocidal numbers, um, that's not my call. But their light, I've met people. So I, part of my... I near-death experience comes with after gifts and and i have i have a number of these and one of mine is to feel people i feel people's energy as people call it seeing auras it's different for me i feel i feel their light within them but one day um i was walking in portland maine where i was i worked in television and i was walking from the tv station one day and i'm going by the courthouse and I'm going on the sidewalk, and down the sidewalk comes this three-piece suit man, uh, five years older than me, obviously the lawyer. And the guy walking behind him was obviously the the perpetrator. Uh, and 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 he just I could tell by the by his attitude, the way he's walking, and the way he's looking, and the it's just like so. I step off the sidewalk. It, it, uh, to get to go around these guys because this other guy's taking up a lot of space and as i walked by him like three feet away from him the wave of darkness that overcame me gave me like i was suddenly walking through water it's like slow slow everything slowed down i was like what is this and as i went by him i kind of turned and he's staring right at me he's like he knows i can feel him did he still have light in him he couldn't exist without it. He layered it over and covered it over with such darkness that it was radiant from him, like a, like an auric glow in reverse. But so even that you bring sorry. Up, no, it's interesting that you bring up that piece because I'm interested to know, even though lawyers right are there to protect people, but when they are defending someone who they in their heart know has done horrible acts what what are your thoughts you may not have that experience yourself but what are your thoughts on somebody who is knowingly defending someone who's hurting someone else and almost allowing them to continue by by defending them and letting them get away with it yeah it's a really hard thing. I could never be a lawyer. I could <laughs> never be a criminal lawyer. Um, I couldn't do it. And and I've got lawyers in my family. Um, I, I couldn't do it. Not criminal lawyers, but lawyers. And what's their karma? What's their responsibility? What about the what about the corporal who gets the order to throw the grenade? Mm -hmm. Only on the other side of that line, they think they're right. So there's, it's messy. I learned that it's, and it's not just the lawyer who's defending. It's the whole thing is one big schmear of everybody's in trouble because of the way the whole thing works. And so what, what I saw was that the lawyer who's defending the criminal who gets out and then does another heinous crime, which happens, you read about it in the news. This is not hypothetical. Um, it, 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 the, does the pebble that the law that the lawyer drops in the water come back to cling? I and there's a ripple out effect of yeah, there is. But I also know that I've that in my life I've I've had ripple effect as well, mm -hmm. and that that sometimes my ripple effect when I when I when I stood up against a, a domestic abuser who could have snapped me in two. Um, I, I lost his, I lost his friendship. I lost his trust. I, I, it was gone anyway, but on my side, but I, but I broke, I closed the door. The door was closed, never going to open again. And the ripple effect in his life was mm -hmm. because I stood for his wife, um, and did the, well, we also had the law, but 
um, they divorced and his life became difficult for him. Now, does that karma come back upon me? If, that's my only reference. If I'm, if I'm hurting someone, if I'm defending someone I know who's guilty, that might look proportionally different where, from where, sta where we're standing. But that didn't look at all proportionally different from where I was standing when I was dead. There was no, it's like looking at the earth from the moon where you see a flat surface. You don't see any of the detail. Um, and from where I was, the detail went in the other direction. And the other direction that I saw was the, un, I, I, when I say I saw, that's not an accurate statement. It's an experience of consciousness that's far beyond my capacity for communicating what happened to me. But, but the evidence I have for that is the way I've lived my life as an eccentric, you know, doing crazy, like going into domestic violence, uh, you know, and being there in person kind of creep, you know, not putting myself in danger. Just saying that, not putting myself in physical danger, except for this guy could have stabbed me into. Um, the what I saw was that all things are made of light, and nothing exists without it. All are loved, even those parts that are that are to us heinous. All of that is part of the large matrix, and that in comparison from human to human. And this is how I ended up in this position of being super vulnerable to forgiveness. I have, for, I have forgiveness itis and uh, like uh, it's a, it's a uh, hazard of NDE that can endanger a person by being too good to the person who could harm you. You learn your lessons as you go along, but the comparison on this level, it doesn't exist really for me. The comparison only exists into the ultimate and the unlimited. And it's not just humanity. It's the whole of all nature here on earth and the structure of the whole galaxy and universe. We know about black holes consuming gal galaxies. It's not just, you know, uh, what if there's life on those planets, you could ask. Um, it, it's it's uh, the macro and the micro setup here is that everything eats something else. And survival is through eating, and that includes all the aspects of humanity. And so is it my place to judge someone, the lawyer, or it's not? I can't see it. I can't. I, I, that's between them and the ultimate. All I know for me is that, what, that, that, that the karma that I carried into my death for the things that I had done with intent were undeservedly and immediately eliminated, leaving me whole and healed and well and can obviously convicted, full of beauty and life and bliss and awe and uh, transformation when I came back. And if this is what I'm like here, what I was like there, times a million. It is so far beyond. It's why I'm not really an evangelical. It's another thing. I wasn't really, I'm never really trying to convert anybody. I don't really care. I care if people judge me as irrational because I'm actually analytical and quite rational in aspects of my life. Um, but I don't care if anybody believes me mm -hmm. because they're going to find out the moment that they die. The moment of death is awakening. And so we talk a lot about awakening here and I have had other awakenings here, but the real true awakening when the veil comes off is the moment that you die. That is evolution. That's, that is a huge evolution. Um, fear not. And, and, and if someone hurts you deeply and you have anger toward them, use it to protect yourself. Stay away. Do not put yourself in harm's way. Yeah, I thank you for saying that because I think there's a lot of people that have been victimized out there and they get very confused about, oh, should I, you know, I'm supposed to be all loving and forgiving, but there is a protective aspect of anger. And so I think it's yeah. important that people who are in situations really, really hear that it's okay to use that anger to protect themselves and to leave or to go or to fight back in, in whatever ways that they need to, because that's a, 
a form of self-love. You know, it doesn't have to be loving everybody else. It's also about the love for yourself, right? So, so that's such an important message, I think, for people to get. Um, I do have another question about, you know, you've had this crazy experience on the other side of it just so much beauty and so much love and then you reference um still being back and feeling a sense of homelessness because that felt oh, yeah. so like home to you so I'm wondering if you can speak to that as well as I think the only you know human experience we have of that is maybe homesick and maybe the difference between those and then also what it is like to just feel homeless in your version of that word well i had a, a an opposite sort of situation from early on um, my mom characterizes it with the first day of sleepover summer camp when i was eight years old when i got to camp i, I hugged her goodbye and i turned and i walked away with my suitcase and mm -hmm. i never looked back and because because as a younger child, when I was five, I had an out-of-body experience where I was taken into the divine being, where I understood who I was and where I was from. And so even as a child, I, my home was already not here. And so I had a sort of predisposition for that circumstance. But so when I came... Pardon? A tough upbringing. Well, no. I had a loving family. Okay. I had a loving family till my sister vanished. And then they're still loving, but they're, they were, it was a very big breaking kind of situation. A lot of, a lot of casualty in this and what happened. But previous to that, it was a loving, kind of, kind of caring family. It's just that, and I had a home and my home was with my parents. And, but I, when when a person experiences the other side at any age, um, there is a recognition of true origin that is inescapable. But I learned as a child not to talk about it because I couldn't be I couldn't explain it and I and no and I got in trouble for talking about it. So I learned to keep my mouth shut and just live with the experience. Now you didn't expect me to say that about this homeless uh, kind of reverse thing. Um, where I was already feeling homeless, but not for earth. Um, so by the time I came back, though, from my first near-death experience, that intensified to a bazillion degrees. It went from maybe, you know, 100 degrees to a bazillion. And, and now it wasn't like I wasn't, I was okay with walking away from my mom and going to summer camp because I had, as I carried my little home inside my heart um, to this whole place feeling like I was uh, an alien inhabiting someone else's body and nothing here was could possibly give me comfort in comparison to the comfort I had on the other side. It wasn't so much that this place was bad. It's that the other place was so much immeasurably better, so far beyond here. And it left enough of itself inside of me that it, that my, I became an entirely different person. I, 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 I ceased, I had all my traits and characteristics. I had all of my physical, physical things. I was the same height, had the same hair, had the same allergies, same eye color, everything was the same, but I was an entirely different person. I, everything was, I lived non-attached to everything, including myself. I was above myself looking through my eyes into an alien world where I knew I was not home and I had made the biggest mistake I had ever made by coming back here to this prison, to this exclusion, to this, this uh, exile, to this confinement, this density, this horrible suffering place where everything hurt. And I, well, it gets back to the whole closet thing. How could I possibly explain that to anyone? And and yet every person I met, every single person I met, radiated love, radiated light. Every plant, every bird, every chickadee or dragonfly, everything. 
everything, even rocks and rivers and streams and stones and 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 still it wasn't home, and still it was less than, and still it was this um, waywardness wandering through the world, trying to find a place to put my foot to give me balance. And I found nowhere here. There's nowhere here for balance. And, and this crazy sort of inversion, I found that my balance increases here the more I set my weight and point of pivot in heaven. The more I backweight myself into the divine, the easier it is for me to feel a portion of heaven here. And as I've cultivated the space inside myself to do that, heaven has come to here enough for me to not want to pray every day to die so I can get out of here. And which I did for the longest time. And the I, I created a prison for myself, but I couldn't, I created a prison for myself in my closet of darkness and despair. And it would have been an easier burden to have shared this with others, but there was no one to share it with. Nowadays, uh, with the near-death experience community as a whole coming out of the closet, we have each other. And so to share this homelessness, I don't feel that as much anymore, partly because I died again. And when I came back again, I, I'm like all, I chose to come back again. I'm all in this time. I know the duration of my life. I know that it's not forever. And and so I'm doing better now than I ever have before. But it's in part because I talked about I talk about it with people now. I'm so glad you are sharing and you know, giving people the courage to not be so fearful that they might be deemed crazy. Um, I think the more people that speak about it, um, mm -hmm. Everyone. I am curious to know with it being so beautiful on the other side and we are all love and light when we're over there no suffering no hatred no judgment if that is who we are in our natural state love and light why do we need to come back here if that mm -hmm. is our natural state there you know, what is the purpose of coming back if we exist over there in such immense beauty? And then also, why can't we learn through love here in higher droves? Well, if you can remind me the first part after I answer the second part first. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, because, because love is... I think it's I think it's in the Upanishads where it warns against using the word love for what is described variously as Brahma, Atman, Allah, Allaha, Yahweh, divine light, supreme being. The the though love approximates this best. It's it's and and because love has ten thousand forms here, my love for my daughter is different than my love for my son. They're both love. They're different love. Mm -hmm. And so it has 10,000 forms here. And so in that way, it's similar because everyone is beloved in their own way. But it's also a trap because we equate this experience of my love for a human or a, or a pet. In our imaginations, it becomes that's a representation of the divine when really it's just a metaphor. It's so much greater and inconceivable, inconceivably beyond that, that even though every word we use to describe it becomes its own trap. And love is the one I choose to use. Most many NDEers, love and light, we choose these words, but it's no, it's no more the love that we experience here uh, in an equality than it is a photon. It's, it's of a different order of energy that is inexpressible. So, but love is also the treasure of life. When I went through my hell experience, 
I didn't just carry with me all the pain I'd given away in my life. I carried with me all the love I'd given away and all the love that had been given to me. And it became like a lens of hearing for me. It was through the lens of love that I had with me that I could hear the divine speaking to me. So any drop of love could be the lens. And so who's excluded from that? Are there people who don't even have a drop of this? I don't know. Maybe. But it is the, it is the thing of which we are made. So I don't know. So it's hard to love is the treasure that relieves my stress around everyone's evolution at awakening and death. Everybody gets to love here. So I have no fear over that or concern. But for the first part of why come here? Why why do we come back if we if we know if we are in our most beautiful natural state? Why come So back? it's many it's a many layered thing, this thing that is no thing. It is when I I, I saw myself in many levels of my soul self and the I uh, to bring it to a more human level I saw my I saw a lot of incarnations so I I have over my lifetime as I come out of the closet I keep coming out of the closet I have little closets inside my closet <laughs> because, I, you know, I try to be cautious. I kept my whole reincarnation thing a secret from the church. Um, if I lied about anything when asked about that, I lied about that in like commission. Because <laughs> um, I didn't want to get defrocked and lose my job. So, so I've been coming out about my incarnations. And that's really a question. The question of why do we come back is really from where I am a question of my incarnations but also my oversoul above my incarnations and myself that could see the oversoul that was like a a photon of the divine uh, septillion photons of the great field of energy that has no depth and breadth and width of which i am a part but i'm also a limited form i am the same as but i'm outside of and i'm superpositioned and them is the them and the many are also one and i'm also it's so I saw myself as this, I saw myself as inflated with this oneness of being where all these component parts, love and beauty and hope and truth and pa paradise and passion and understanding and knowledge, and all these components of the single word I use for love. I was these things, but I also had this other self and this other self was less than that self. And this other self, I've been, I've taken to describing it as a baguette because it's a, people know what a baguette is. Uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a very long loaf of bread that was my oversoul. And my, in my oversoul of all my incarnations, I was above seeing this. Um, and in my oversoul were kebab spears shoved in. And these kebab spears were all the lives I had lived in a sequence, in a chronology. But from my point of view, they were all happening at the same time. I was so far above. You saw all your past lives? I even went into two of them. And I saw before my lives began, I saw the origin of myself, the origin of my soul self, my not human self, my not incarnational self, my not self that, that gets incarnated. I, 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 I. I am always being called into being by the name in Christian language. It's the, the, my, the, my word, my, the word of myself being called into being my, the expression of the, of the origin of myself, always in the eternal now, always. Well, this is like this, this is the source of my conviction. This is like how I know who I am. I'm not this life. I've never been this life. I'm, this is, I'm living in this thing and I've lived in a whole bunch of these other things. And I saw inside of two of them and they were all happening simultaneously from my point of view. I went through a uh, cleansing at the end of my life 1.0 from this body. So I had karma. I had actions that had created the necessity for me 
for a cleansing to see all of this. But I'll tell you that in this life, I know this much. And in the other life, I knew everything I wanted to know. This is for me, the my stupid place. I am so much reduced here. I can't even... It's why it's so funny to me half the time. I have a really great sense of humor because it's like really funny here. Um, so all of that is to say is to say this is 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 that the unlimited. What's the one thing that the unlimited can't have? It's a rabbinical question. Rabbis, this, I, I stole it from a rabbi. What's the one thing the unlimited can't have? It's limitedness. And so there's an expression and an expansion. Hinduism has it with Brahma, on, the, the tongue unfolds and, and universes are created. Um, the divine can't, it can because it is all things, but I am an expression of this. How did, how did I experience all of the pain and suffering inside of my sister that I gave her when she was you know, 12 years old and I was like zinging her with whatever that was? because the divine was my sister, is my sister, and is me. I am in my limitation. I am the, the divine is experiencing the world through me. That's how the life review happens. It wasn't some scribe up there with a pen or data entering or a camera and, and you know AI going through it and consolidating it. No, it's the divine in me experiencing it live time. So, there was a man named Eli, Elie Wiesel, and Elie Wiesel was a famous author, um, was a professor at Boston University, lived through a genocide in a concentration camp. And as he's standing in front of the execution of a bunch of Jews in the crowd of Jews by the Nazis, ordered to watch, one, he overheard this man say, so rabbi where's your god now and the rabbi says up there about to be hung with those people there is no separation between the divine experiencing our suffering and us the problem is us the problem is that i that, that i become so self-identified with my humanity and my identity and my e egoic self that I think it's all about me, even my suffering. Mm. And, and there's this powerful thing that happens. I, I still have suffering. I, I hurt myself on my bike last week. And it's still, you know, like, oh, geez, what I do. Um, and there's emotional suffering. It doesn't stop that. Mm. But when one cultivates the internal knowledge and connection to your original self, the the suffering becomes less of a burden because the whole thing is less of a burden. So why do we come back life after life after life? What's the point of that? One of it is that is the, we're nodes of the divine on, you know, moles or spies for the divine in life form. But also I saw progression in my incarnations and I've experienced progressions in my spiritual mystical out-of-body experiences that have been come by grace um, in revelations that have continued to reveal myself that I am a many-layered thing. And that, that in my incarnations, I, I entered into like a lizard form. I was like, I got to peek into a lizard life. Was it an uh, intelligent lizard? I don't know. Was it a gecko? Good or bad. Um, but all I know is that I was not a human being and I don't even know where I was, another earth or this earth or whatever, I have no idea. But then I saw myself, I entered into a life where I was a man and I was had, I could see from inside the body. I had legs and I was wearing cloth and I had sandals and it was a dirt road and there were people walking with me and having this conversation and I could see palm trees and, this, and, and it was in ancient times and I could see it in the timeline. I could see it in the, the chronology where this thing was and uh, and and I wasn't that. I wasn't that. I was the I was the witness of that. I'm still the witness of that. And that 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 over my lifetimes, I think I've begun to wedge myself free 
from my own attachment to lifetimes. I think that's what's going on. And I don't know that for a fact. Will I come back again? Maybe. Maybe I'll volunteer this time. Maybe I'll come back this time because I, not just because everybody picks their life, but because I think that there's more light to be brought into the world. Can you speak a little bit more to the witness? So when people have a hard time not understanding how they're like, I am my body, this is me, as opposed to I am the witness. So I I definitely am my body. So uh, there is, I am aging. Uh, I, I do sports that make me in my body. I purposefully do things in my life to embody myself. I mean, I, that's part of my whole thing. I'm trying to get embodied here. And so I'm I'm trying to identify with my body. I know I'm my body. When I fell off my bike a week ago, I was like very aware that, that I am my body. <laughs> but there is this other part of us that's accessible through, primarily through meditation, but not exclusively, where through uh, a mindfulness practice uh, where the empty self is the aim, the no language, no person present self practice. What happens is that there becomes a separation, an identification. There's this identification with the false self that is artificial. It's real in that it's, it's in our brains. It's chemically based. We need it for survival in the world. We, you know, we build tribes and societies because we have this egoic capacity but it's also not actually us. And in a, in a meditative practice where that monkey mind, as it's so called, can be stopped for a moment at a time, a spark like a like striking a stone against metal, you get a spark of moment, a spark of moment, a spark of moment. Once that happens, once you have an experience of that, and you realize that there's a deeper level to yourself, the practice becomes easier. And then what happens is... As the emotions arise and you see I have this anger, my, my anger didn't magically disappear when I came back from my NDE. I still had a lot of anger to deal with and face. My trauma didn't go away. It didn't you know, magically make me whole. Um, I found that in my meditation life that as, I, as my anger rose up, I could have a better view of it. I could have a better understanding of the sources of it in myself, but also that it was not me. And so this constant practice of identifying not as self, it's not like I'm trying to identify as something else because this something else is no thing. It is no self. And so I can't really identify with it. I can de-identify with my egoic self. And so the process of meditation uh, where perhaps a single word is used and, and, and attached to the breath and then the word falls away and you're just left with breathing, that's a form of this, where you're just following your breath. You can People do this in yoga all the time when they're just using their body. They're not listening to the instructor or music. They're paying attention to their body and their breath. And now they're not actually thinking and, and language. They're just being. This just being place is the access point to your original self. And so there can be an accumulation of experience after experience of witnessing self, this emotion, that emotion, um, this idea that creates a new understanding of who you are. So it's incremental. It's not simple. It's simple. The practice is simple. But the difficulty is in dedication to a practice. But the results are universal. They're not, I'm not making this up. This is all over the world. This is my experience. But people have been practicing these techniques for thousands of years because they work. That's why people do them. Um, So the witness state itself gives power. There's power in the witness state because then when you're in a situation with a narcissist who is projecting on you, you not only can see the narcissist as a narcissist because you know that this person is because you have education, you get to step back from yourself and see yourself. And therefore, you're not having to 
um, uh, to react, you can respond. And when you respond, you have, when you are your higher self, when you have attachment to your higher self, you, there is a level of control that comes with the witness state. And that level of control has practical applications. And so this is a, it's a tool that can be used in a negotiation at, at a, in a, a legal situation or a corporate situation or uh, any situation where, where, where one becomes increasingly identified, disidentified with the false self and more identified with the original self. Because there's this other thing that happens with this. This isn't a, also not theoretical. There's an energy form here. In, in Hinduism, they call it Shakti or Shaktipat. Christians call it the Holy Spirit. Some people call it Chi. You call it Prana. We, ex we feel this energy. And maybe you have it with a person. Maybe you have it with several people. This is not just those things. It is us. This energy is us. And that energy is the divine. And with this deeper state of, of, of learning to witness oneself by, by de-identifying, by backfooting into heaven, by the, the practice of elimination of egoic attachment, uh, there comes along this presence with it. And this presence with it um, is no self. It is the original self. It's the divine energy. It's, it's all of you and so much more. And this is where the power actually is. But it's not a power to wield. It's a power to be in and let it be in your life. And it gives these tools of witnessing state and empathy. And, but it doesn't fix things. It doesn't go around and you know, set my broken bone. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make my... It changes all my relationships because I'm changed. I'm no longer trying to change it out here. I'm definitely working in here. And, and I, what I discover is that when I'm like, if I'm in a grocery store and somebody barrels around the corner with their cart and they can't even see that I'm there and they don't even care. You know, maybe they run over my foot and they knock the, the, the thing out of my hand to make this very dramatic. Um, <laughs> that you know i have a reaction you know my foot hurts i get a little angry i'm upset they're like they didn't even see me and so i have this little but if i have this space inside myself that i've cultivated i can retreat there in the circumstance of the arising of this flash of emotion and bring myself back into my original self to my home that i carry inside where i then can live better in the world in relationship to those people around me and not run down the aisle and push this person down and pour milk all over them. <laughs> um, uh, instead, I can manage myself. And in managing myself, I get to manage um, the world in which I live to without ill intent, just with peace as best I can. Um, so the witness day is a byproduct of mystical experience. It's a byproduct of meditation and it can be cultivated and it has tools that make life easier. Thank you for that. Yeah. Well, and I will just ask one last question to respect your time. Um, but what is the one thing that is most important that you feel others should know? I would guess it would be two things. One is love. Love. That's it. Love the best you can. Much kindness as you can find inside yourself. But this, this you don't need meditation. You don't need to be a believer. You don't need to have mystical experience. You don't have to have spiritual transformative experiences. You can be an atheist. Love is the key to all of this um, here in our human lives. But there is an enhancement. And it can be enhanced by an interior journey into the oneness, into the singleness, into the light, where the process of the elimination of self, of attachment to self, uh, creates greater opportunity for the presence to be inside us, to raise your prana, to, 
uh, to uh, have the chi be a tool to use in the world. The deeper you go inside yourself, the less self that's in the way, the more the gifts come. And so instead of seeking the gifts, seek the giver. Because with the giver come all these gifts unimaginable. If you seek the gift, you might get that one. And you might get it well. But there's this whole other pile of gifts waiting. Beautiful. And for those who don't know, chi prana is breath, life force energy. Breath, life force energy, right. Thank you so much, Peter, for just being such a wonderful teacher and gift to so many. So I really do appreciate your time. And I'm sure after rewatching this, I'll have many more questions. So we'll see what happens next. (laughs) All right. It was nice to meet you, Lizzie. Nice to meet you too, Peter. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Me too.